Welcome, everybody. Good morning. And how is your morning going? How are you today? Good? Good? Awesome. Empowered. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad to be here with you today as well. Are you up for a little empowerment on this Sunday morning? Yes? yes? yes. All right. Let's get to it. Adam, thank you for that song. I, I love hearing you sing. I love your talent and your gift. That particular song is one I have wanted to hear in this center for some time. Uh, Stand in the Light is a song by a young, a young man named Jordan Smith. I think he was on The Voice. And I have loved that song from the moment I heard it. And it's a beautiful song, gorgeous song. But I especially love the message in that song in this month of empowerment. And that line, uh, this is who I am inside. This is who I am. I'm not going to hide. Have you had those experiences in life where you didn't necessarily feel the freedom to be yourself or to be exactly who you are or that posed some sort of conflict or problem in your life. And so I love that part of the song and that line, but the line in it that makes the greatest impact on me is the line that says, the greatest risk we will ever take is by far to stand in the light and be seen as we are. Man, that is a, a hugely impactful statement to me. And I suspect that that is the reason for difficulty sometimes in being who we are, in living the truth of who I am and, and presenting that to the world in all my glory and with all my flaws and everything in between. If that risk is too great. And so I will tell you that I have spent much of a lifetime with struggles around authenticity. And Reverend Liza, thank you for your introduction and saying that I stand in the light and, and all of those things. And, and I will tell you that I am a work in progress, but I learned at an early, early age, what a great risk it was to be me. And this goes back to, I must have been four years old, maybe five, so that has to be at least 20 years ago, <laughs> something like that, you know, I said at least. Um, I will turn 54 on Tuesday, so it's somewhere in the realm of 48, 49, 50 years ago. And I was a little bitty boy. I was at my grandmother's house one afternoon. She was babysitting while my parents were at work. And we hosted a family reunion every summer in my little hometown, and we would have... 100, 120 people every year show up for this family reunion. And this particular day, my grandmother's house started to fill with members of our extended family. And I was a little boy, so some of these people I didn't know, or if I knew them, I didn't know them well for sure. But they weren't my, my you know, in my normal group, my grandparents or my parents who, who were with me all the time. And... So I was just doing what I always did, which was just to play and explore and, and really just uh, live in this childlike world of wonder, really. And at the time, my, my favorite toy, my favorite possession on planet Earth was a little doll that I had. And so, standing in the light, in authenticity, you now have the goods on me. Yes, I played with dolls when I was a kid. 
or at least one doll. I had this doll, and I loved it, and I, I took it with me everywhere. I tended to it and watched after it and drugged it through the dirt and the mud, and it was this, um, much like me, it had, had blonde hair and blue eyes, and its little eyes would bat at me, and it had sort of pink pajamas with these little tiny po white polka dots on it. This little doll had a string that you could pull. Do you remember those? It had a string, and then the string would feed back in, and it would say things to me. And I don't remember all the lines that this doll was capable of saying, but I remember that every once in a while I would pull that string, and she would say to me, Hello, Mommy. To which I would respond... I'm not your mommy, I'm your daddy, right? That's how I would respond to this statement. And this one particular afternoon at my grandmother's house, uh, my grandmother and grandpa seemed to have no issues with my carting around this little doll in its pink pajamas. My parents didn't seem to have any issue with that either. I, I would think they probably bought the doll for me, I guess. I don't really know that for sure, but... They seemed to have no problem with it. But on this day, amongst a larger group of people, um, I found that not everybody took to that idea as well as my parents and grandparents did. And so that afternoon, the ribbing began, the heckling of this little tiny boy carrying around a doll, and those lines started being repeated to me about boys don't play with dolls. Big boys certainly don't play with dolls. You know, only girls play with dolls. Why don't you put that thing away and, you know, go do what little boys do, which clearly in the minds of cousins and aunts and uncles was not play with this little doll for which I had such an affinity And so I came to understand the risk it meant to be authentic and to be who I was. And so I did what I could think of to do, which was to take this little doll, my favorite possession, I took her into the kitchen, to the trash can, and I threw her away. Not to worry. She was rescued. <laughs> my... My grandmother um, eventually went to the trash can for some reason that afternoon and saw the doll in there and pieced two and two together and understood why I threw it away. And so she rescued the doll and cleaned it off. And when my mother picked me up that evening, she explained to my mom what happened and gave her the doll. And we went home that evening and my mom took this little doll of mine and laid her to rest where she would spend the remainder of her days locked in my mother's cedar chest. And in that moment, when she locked that little doll away, I locked something away within myself. Because it was no longer safe just to be me. Just to be me in the light of this little child's eyes just exploring the world no longer felt safe to me. And in fact, to be me meant ridicule. And so I locked that some degree of authenticity away because of the way that other people looked at me. And without any question, it's super important how we see ourselves, but I've come to understand that the way other people see us can also have a hugely profound impact on the way we see ourselves. I think that's a hugely important idea. Now, I have a, a little video 
that I'm going to show about this today. There's a little tiny video. It's about three or three and a half minutes long. It is decades old. It is black and white. It is low quality, but the message is incredible. And it is uh, from Dr. Viktor Frankl. We've probably all heard of him, at least many of us have. Uh, This is a little video um, of Dr. Frankel talking about the power we wield in the ways in which we look at one another. So with that, I'll see you guys in just about three minutes. Here is Viktor Frankl. Excuse me, but... uh... I know I am speaking a marvelous accent without the slightest English. Now, <laughs> you know, you won't believe it. Gray, uh, gray hair of my age, I started taking flying lessons recently. Do you know what my flying instructor told me? If you are starting here, wish to get here, say east, heading for this, and you have a crosswind, you will drift and you will land here. So you have to do what we pilots call uh, crabbing, he told me, C-R-A-B, crabbing. You have to head for north of this uh, uh, air, air field, and you have to fly that way, you see, as if you had it in this direction. If you are heading here above this airfield, then you will actually land here. But if you head for here, you are landing here. This holds also for man, I would say. If we, if we take man as he really is, we make him worse. But if we overestimate him, It's premature your applause, you will soon know why. If we, if we seem to be idealists and are overestimating, overrating man, and looking at him that high, here above, you know what happens? We promote him to what he really can be. So we have to be idealists in a way, because then we we'll wind up as the true, the real realists. And you know who has said this? If we take man as he is, we make him worse. But if we take man as he should be, we make him capable of becoming what he can be. This was not my flight instructor. This was not me. This was Goethe. He said this verbally. And now you will understand why I, in one of my writings, once said, this is the most apt maxim and motto for any psychotherapeutic activity. So if you don't recognize a young man's will to meaning, man's search for meaning, you make him worse, you make him dull, you make him frustrated, you still add and contribute to his frustration. While if you presuppose in this man, if in this so-called criminal or juvenile delinquent or drug abuse and so forth, there must be a a, what we call spark, yeah? a spark of search for meaning. Let's recognize this, let's presuppose it, and then you will elicit it from him, and you will make him become what he in principle is capable of becoming. So, what are your thoughts on that little video? I will tell you that I found it a couple years ago on the internet, and for me it was a thrill to see Viktor Frankl in that setting, because I've read his work, I've read Man's Search for Meaning a handful of times, I have uh, heard his name dropped in this center so often in other centers, and, and just his story of being in the... Nazi concentration camps and and 
the life that he created thereafter and that sort of thing. So he's, he's heroic, I guess, in my opinion. And so to find that video was a thrill for me personally, but then the message in it, I think, is, is one of such power. It is such an empowering message. He says, to see man as he is, when I see you or you see me as as my foils, my foibles and my frailties and, you know, the, the wins and losses that I've had. Perhaps you miss something that runs much, much deeper. And I love that message. Uh, for me, it is the difference in looking at someone and actually seeing someone, seeing that person. I have a book called Bioenergetics by a, a man named Dr. Alexander Lowen, and he says in this book that we must see people in their expressive natures, right? We have to see beyond that outside stuff. We must see people in their expressive natures And that if we do that, it affects not only the ways that we understand them, but it affects the ways in which they respond to us. We talk about this in, in quantum physics, right? The way I see something affects the way it behaves to me. The way I see a person affects the way they respond to me. This, to me, is empowerment. This is what empowerment is about to me. And it's that difference between look at and see. And that brings me to my talk title for today. And my talk title, there you have it, is Stop Looking at Me. Do you remember that when you were a kid and your sibling or your cousin was staring you down and that sort of thing, you know, and, and it just kind of made you crazy? Stop looking at me. Mom, Dad, he's looking at me kind of a thing. Well, that is my ask today is that you stop looking at me, that we stop looking at one another, that we stop looking at the world and begin to see. Because in my mind, looking at someone puts distance between us. If I look at you, I suddenly create distance. What happens if I see you instead? then I see through that distance. I see beyond that distance and I just might see you and that light within that is just begging to come out. I might, in fact, create the space in which it's allowed to do so. That's what Viktor Frankl just said. I have wondered a thousand times over the course of my life how my experience of life might have been different if 50 or so years ago the adults in the room rather than looking at a little boy playing with a doll and therefore heckling him had instead seen him and seen the fact that what he was doing was exploring the world, was learning, was growing, was trying to figure out how to stretch his wings and experience more and more and more. Do you think that might have made a difference in my life? This, folks, is the power we wield when we see one another. Can you imagine what we are capable of becoming, what we are capable of creating, what our world might step 
into the potential it could possibly fulfill if we simply made that adjustment and stopped looking at one another and began to see one another. I know it is not always easy to see past behavior. I understand that. I see the th same things going on in the world that you see. Yes, it's a challenge. But this is our charge. It is that important. It is that important to look beyond behavior, to stop keeping score, and to create that space in which we can rise to our potential, and to create the space in which we can become that of which we are capable. And right now, probably like never before in history, the world is crying out for that acknowledgement. The world is crying out for you and I to stand in our light of our authentic natures, to be who we are. Hell, we've tried being something else long enough and it doesn't seem to be that fruitful. It's probably time for us to stand in our authenticity and just let that shine. Because right now the world needs you to stand in your authentic nature and let it be seen. I need you to stand in your authentic nature and allow your light to shine. And why is that important? Because just like those other childhood stories that we're not going to discuss today, when you show me yours, I'll show you mine. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Sunday, everybody. Much love to you all.